The Commission on Judicial Appointments is now in session. Chief Justice Tani Cantil Sakaue presiding. Good morning, all, and welcome to the public hearing of the Commission on Judicial Appointments. As Chief Justice of California, I serve as Chair of the Commission, and our members are Attorney General Javier Becerra and Presiding Justice J. Anthony Klein, and Charlie Cahoon serves as Secretary to the Commission. This hearing is to consider Governor Edmund G. Brown Jr.'s appointment of Mr. Joshua P. Groban to the Office of Associate Justice of the California Supreme Court. We are in receipt of a letter from Governor Brown appointing Mr. Groban to fill a vacancy created by the retirement of Associate Justice Catherine M. Werdegar. The state constitution specifies that an appointment by the governor to the Supreme Court becomes effective when confirmed by the Commission on Judicial Appointments. We received correspondence pertaining to this appointment and we made these letters available to the press and to the public several days ago. Pursuant to a request by Governor Brown, the State Bar's Commission on Judicial Nominees Evaluation has undertaken an evaluation of the qualifications of Mr. Groban. And Mr. David W. Firmino, Chair of the Jenny Commission, is present today and will publicly announce the results of that evaluation later in these proceedings. Mr. Groban has asked that the following persons be called to testify on his behalf. I'll list you all now and then invite you separately up to the podium. We have the Honorable Carlos Moreno, retired Associate Justice, Supreme Court of California, welcome. The Honorable Arthur Gilbert, Presiding Justice, Court of Appeal, Second Appellate District, Division Six. The Honorable Terry M. Stewart, Associate Justice of the Court of Appeal, First Appellate District, Division Two. And Mr. Ronald Eld Olson, partner, Munger Tolls and Olson. We'll begin with uh, Justice Moreno. I invite you to the podium. Good morning, uh, Madam Chief Justice. Attorney General Becerra, Presiding Justice uh, Klein. It's my great pleasure to be before you uh, this fine morning to speak on behalf of Governor Brown's nominee to the court, Joshua Groban. Before I go further, let me just also say that speaking from here, uh, it's been over 17 years since I was at this very podium speaking on my own behalf and answering questions from the commission as a then nominee to the court. It is now my honor and my great privilege to say a few words about the nominee and why I think he will be an outstanding addition to what most consider the premier and most often cited state Supreme Court in the nation. I personally know the significance and importance of the court's work, its obligation to clarify the law, establish precedent, the need to address the many important legal and equitable questions we face in a state and society as complex as that in California. But I can tell you quite confidently, Joshua is up for the task and he is prepared. Besides adding to the geographical diversity, to the composition of the court, coming from Southern California, something I take quite personally, if confirmed, Joshua will take a strong, deliberative, thoughtful, and collegial element to the workings of the court, its traditions, and with its individual justice. His experience in the private sector, working as an attorney for the, most, uh, the nation's most prestigious law firms, the Stanford and Harvard Law School uh, pedigree, his federal clerkship, his teaching experience at UCLA are sufficient enough to demonstrate that he has the intellectual chops to help decide the difficult, cutting edge, but absolutely essential cases that the court decides. And let me just say a little bit about his appellate practice court at the UCLA Law School. His syllabus in that uh, course is a virtual primer on all of the procedural and practical aspects of appellate practice, from applicable standards of review, timing deadlines, significant pending issues considered by the various appellate courts in the state, even how to argue uh, before an appellate panel, and so much more. So from that standpoint, he is also well prepared to be and to serve with distinction on the California Supreme Court. But it is his executive work that really stands out. First, by advising Governor Brown 
on pending legislation and litigation, parole, and other policy decisions, but most notably, as I think others will address, it is his work in carrying out the vision of Governor Brown, a vision first articulated by you, Justice Klein, in attaining that most laudable goal of achieving wide and full diversity in the judicial branch. I think it's unprecedented what the governor has achieved for this great state through the hard work, insight, judge of character, and judge of competence that Joshua brought to that legacy, the governor's legacy, as his senior legal advisor these past two terms. It's almost too hard to fathom the vetting of hundreds of applicants and the appointment of approximately 600 uh, judges throughout the state, an accomplishment that has literally changed not only the complexion, but also the gender composition of our judicial branch. I'm gonna quote, close by quoting Socrates in a book given to me many years ago called Handbook for Judges. And for me, the quote encapsulates the job of the judge in four easy principles. And Joshua, you will be do well by keeping these principles in mind. Socrates said, four things belong to a judge, to hear courteously, to answer wisely, to consider soberly, and to decide impartially. Joshua, I know that you will do well. You've shown me that you have those very judicial qualities essential to your position on the court. With all the success in your life, with your beautiful family who are here, and in your outstanding career, I have no doubt, and this commission should have no doubt, that you will be a courteous, a wise, a considerate, and an impartial judge as a justice of the California Supreme Court. I have nothing further. Thank you, Justice Moreno. I welcome the Honorable Arthur Gilbert to the podium. Uh, Chief Justice Sakaui, Attorney General Becerra, and Presiding Justice Klein. You all look so familiar. You know, from my perspective down here, I know you all so well. Uh, from the lectern and looking up here, the exceptional qualities you all have are greatly enhanced and even magnified. Doesn't hurt to butter up the panel, does it? <laughs> well, I've never heard you so generous. Maybe you ought to stay down, <laughs> stay down. I could keep going. Well, a little buttering up never hurts. Oh, yes. <laughs> well. Justice Klein and I have known each other for, for too many years. Uh, like many of my Court of Appeal colleagues, I've had the privilege from time to time to sit by assignment on our Supreme Court. This often happens when there's a vacancy. Now, I've been around so long that I've had the occasion to sit with many iterations of our, of our High Court. And with the current vacancy, I had the honor of sitting with the present court Mm, a few times, once, twice, maybe three times, I don't know. And that opportunity gave me uh, additional insights. The justices who reflect the diversity of our state each bring to their opinions the highest level of scholarship and intellectual rigor. And yes, there is a vacancy, and Josh Groban is the ideal candidate to fill that vacancy. You know, I've never called him Joshua. Where did you get Josh? That's his, I guess that's his, I've always called him Josh, so I'm gonna stay with that. I've known Josh for about eight years, and I, along with others, have worked closely with him vetting candidates for both trial and appellate courts. Uh, now, as we know, many superior court judges sat pro tem on the Court of Appeal, and many of those judges were appointed to the Court of Appeal. In evaluating uh, these potential candidates for the Court of Appeal, Josh, of course, read their opinions, and we discussed them at length. His analysis of those opinions demonstrated critical thinking, exceptional legal acuity, and the high degree of scholarship we require for a Supreme Court justice. Uh, he ensured that the most capable candidates were appointed to our judiciary, and they reflected the citizens of our state. And he has shown that a diverse bench 
meets the, higher, the highest standards of excellence. Because of his efforts in closely working with Governor Brown, California judiciary is a leader in the nation. For many years, as, uh, as um, Justice Moreno mentioned, he taught a course in appellate advocacy at UCLA, which I have attended, and on occasion have shared with the class what I hope was a useful insight or two. In this valuable class on all aspects of appellate advocacy, Josh has done much to pave the way for new lawyers so they will be able to analyze statutory and case law, write with clarity and concision, and uphold the highest standards of our legal profession. He's advised the governor on very complex legal matters, including criminal justice, governmental regulations, and First Amendment issues, just to name a few. And you're going to hear more about him as a practicing lawyer. He handled a wide variety of complex cases in trial and appellate courts. As a student at Harvard Law School, he participated with Professor Ogletree, who I had the pleasure of knowing, in the preparation of death penalty appeals. He wrote draft opinions while clerking for a federal judge. He was even chosen to help edit the staff of the Stanford Law Review when he was an undergraduate. Josh is warm, affable, engaging, and unpretentious. He is open to all points of view. He has a keen mind and ferrets out inconsistencies and ambiguities with a twinkle in his eye. What matters is getting the right result. Josh is a mensch. His collegiality and mutual res the collegiality and mutual respect that exists in the court will continue with Josh as a member. He will bring to our Supreme Court a wealth of practical experience and intellect that ensures its continued excellence. I respectfully and enthusiastically recommend this committee affirm the appointment of Josh Groban to the California Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Gilbert. Wait a minute. Arthur. Yes, oh, I, knew, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> I tried to get down the... <coughs> no, I, I, I know that I'd never hear the end of it if I didn't draw you out. You'd feel ignored. Um, uh, everything you say about Josh Groban, I know to be true. I believe he's qualified uh, to sit on the California Supreme Court. I don't think those are the issues that some people are thinking about. Uh, I'm going to vote for him. I think he's going to be confirmed. But if he is confirmed, uh, then a majority of the members of the California Supreme Court will consist of people who have never previously sat on a court. Yes. Now, during the 16 years that Jerry Brown was governor, he appointed, he nominated, uh, and I'm including Josh Groban, 11 people to the Supreme Court. A majority of them uh, were not, um, had not previously served as yes. judges. Now, there are people in the judicial or judges and people in the legal community who don't think it's healthy uh, for um, a court to be dominated, at least numerically, uh, by people who never sat in the judicial trenches, to whom sitting in a trial court or an appellate court uh, is an abstraction, not a life experience. Now, you started on the municipal court. That's right, a court that doesn't exist anymore. Right. <laughs> I've been around so long. I assume uh, from our years of conversations that your work as a trial judge has significantly informed uh, your work as an appellate judge. No question as, about has it. has been the case with me and I think most appellate judges. Um, now, uh, in his personal data questionnaire, um, Josh, like everybody who wants to be a judge, is asked, what professional accomplishment are you most proud of? And this is what he says. He says, I am proud of the fact that we have made the most diverse appointments in the history of the state not only in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, and sexual orientation, but also in terms of practice background. Now, I think that's largely true. But there is one respect in which uh, the appointments that 
the governor, this governor, has made have, have not been diverse, uh, at least with respect to the Supreme Court. Now, you are a friend of Josh, as I am. Uh, I, I've discussed this issue with Josh on several occasions before he was nominated. And it was his view then, and it was my view, uh, that this uh, the vacancy created by Justice Werdiger uh, should be filled by somebody from uh, the trial or appellate courts. And I, I, I'm confident that Josh Groban is not Dick Cheney. I don't think <laughs> that he no. engineered this. Uh, I, he believed that, at least that's what he told me, and I agree. So, why am I going through all this? Well, because you're Tony Klein, I know. <laughs> right. I could be. Uh, uh, you're his friend. What, what advice would you give him oh. uh, to allay this concern that many judges and, yes. and, and lawyers have? I think what you uh, bring up is a legitimate concern. And in fact, Josh and I have even discussed it. And I'll tell you, when Josh was first uh, going to be appointed to the Court of Appeal, he and I, and Elwood Louie, and we've been around a long time ago, he sought our advice on about judging. And we have spent many a lunchtime talking about our views, uh, and there are other views, of course, uh, the practical side of judging, and about being down in the trenches. Uh, frankly, I thought on the municipal court, when I was, um, I, I had this moniker, the uh, king of traffic. I found that because I was, it was the largest traffic court in the world. And I had tickets translated into Spanish and I, I opened it up to people. I did all kinds, I really, that's when you really had power on the municipal court. Now you need another vote, you know, if you're on the Court of Appeal and, uh, and certainly on the Supreme Court. And I found that was extremely valuable. And uh, Elwood and I and Josh have had long discussions on the phone and in person, and he sought our advice about it. And it's true, uh, he hasn't had trial experience, and I've heard this uh, uh, complaint just in general. You know, William uh, O. Douglas and uh, Justice Black, he'd been, uh, well, Justice Black had been a police court judge at one time, came onto the court and they were giants. Uh, I think Roger Trainer was a giant, who was uh, one of the most uh, impressive justices in the 20th century. I think many of us feel that way. Uh, he never sat on a trial court. So we, we can't always tell how a judge is gonna, is gonna turn out. Uh, so I think you, you have a, a point, but he is so interested in seeking out views, and he has such a warm connection with other people, uh, and a sympathy, a kind of uh, uh, understanding of human nature that I think he's gonna be a, a superb justice, despite not having been down in the trenches. Um, in fact, he brings some practical experience as a practicing lawyer. He's appeared in front of judges many times, and he's written opinions, uh, helped write opinions on the federal, uh, for the federal judge he was clerking for. Um, I think he's gonna be terrific. Thank you, Justice Gilbert. Thank you. I invite the Honorable Terry Stewart to the podium. Thank you, Chief Justice Kantil Sakaue, um, Justice Klein, Attorney General Becerra. I have worked with Josh over the past four years on the work that has been mentioned in both Justice Moreno and Justice Gilbert's remarks about diversifying the bench. And to me, what epitomizes Josh Groban is his understanding that for a justice system to be just, it must be made up of judges who are not only wise and intelligent, but reflect, who reflect the people that the system serves. And Josh has dedicated the last eight years of his life to accomplishing that in California and to, to pushing that forward beyond where we were. People think of him as the guy who vetted um, Governor Brown's appointees or nominees, candidates, um, but that doesn't really begin to capture the work that he did and the impact that he's had on the judiciary. Um, of course, he spent a lot of time reviewing applicants' papers, their opinions, if they were trial judges, their, uh, their briefs. Um, he even like watched a video of um, my marriage argument before interviewing me and asked me why I didn't ask a certain question. 
Um, there can be no doubt that he has a good grasp of what's important in a judge. And the course that he teaches at UCLA, it's, it's really an impressive syllabus. It made me want to go back to law school, but maybe I'll get him to teach it up here and I'll audit. Um, but for me, more than anything, it's his commitment to diversifying our bench that gets to the heart of who he is and why he'll make a good justice, a great justice. Let me pause to acknowledge that the governor has played some role in the work that Josh has done, um, creating a bench that's uh, more reflective of our, our population as a state is, of course, the governor's policy. But it was Josh who really rolled up his sleeves and implemented that policy, and he did it relentlessly. He had many other responsibilities for the governor, and he could have done a, an okay job, even a good job, and not been criticized on this particular task. But he wasn't content to just review applications of the people who applied to the bench um, in the hope that there would be an adequately diverse body of candidates. He pro proactively reached out to bar groups, um, both uh, regular bar associations, minority bar groups. He made presentations to encourage more women, more Asian American, more African American, more Latinx, more LGBT, and other lawyers to apply for judicial positions. He took the mystery for them out of that black box of what it means to try to become a judge. He told them what an application should look like, what the governor cared about. He um, talked about how to prepare for a career on the bench. He also spent a lot of time with leaders of both bars and judge groups that were made up of uh, people who had been underrepresented on the bench. And he talked to us about who did we know who might be interested in putting their name in? Who, what did we know about the people who'd already applied? Would they make good judges? Um, he told us when he needed to receive applications. He said how we could help him. And one of the things I remember him saying is, I'm having trouble getting enough applicants of color and applicants who are women from rural counties because they're just, they're not coming in. What can you do to um, find me candidates? And we contacted Josh a lot ourselves with suggestions and he always took the calls and he always listened to what we had to say. So what did he accomplish by all that effort and all that work? I looked at the statistics for the judicial branch for the end of 2017, which is the last year of this administration for which we have complete statistics. And um, I compared it with the 2010 statistics at the end of the last administration. As a result of Josh's efforts, the number of Asian American California bench officers has increased by more than 30% from 92 to 120 judges. And when you think about how when you're hiring or, or finding judges, you have to not only add, um, you have to not only replace the ones who are retiring and then add to get ahead. The number of African American judges has increased by more than 28% from 95 to 122. The number of Latino Latina judges has increased by more than 24% from 139 to 173. And now for the first time ever, the percentage of those groups on California's bench is greater than their percentage representation in the state bar, which of course is the group from which judges have to be drawn. The number of sitting judges who are women has increased by almost 11% and is going to increase even more after this year um, when the number of the percentage of judges he's appointed, uh, Governor Brown has appointed, has been 50% of the 180 judges that have been appointed. And before this administration, nobody even kept track of, much less recruited LGBT judges. But to si suffice it to say, we were underrepresented. As of the end of 2017, there were about 53 sitting judges who were openly LGBT, and for the first time ever, we were on the appellate bench as well as the trial court. And these aren't, as uh, Justice Gilbert alluded to, the only kinds of diversity Josh has pursued. There are more public defenders on the bench, and that never used to be the case. There were very few. Um, he had uh, appointed the first Muslim American to uh, a court in California and now more recently elevated that judge to the Court of Appeal. And there are many other examples. So to go to the heart of your question, um, Justice Klein, what, why does this mean? Why does all this work mean that he will be a great Supreme Court justice? What does it mean that he's poured his heart and soul into making it our justice system better than it even already was? It means he himself embodies justice. He will have a great rapport with his colleagues. He gets along with everyone, including people who are very different from him. He will have respect for the appellate judges and trial judges whose work he will review. He will be accessible to the uh, staff attorneys and the other staff of the court with whom he'll work. And perhaps most importantly, he'll bring an open heart and mind to the litigants whose cases come before him. 
He'll also bring his pragmatism, being mindful of the effects of the court's rulings on policy, on other branches of government, and on the people and the businesses of this state. And last but not least, Josh will bring a kind of openness that can be rare among appellate judges. He's easy to talk to. He has a sense of humor that puts people at ease. By way of example, as we talked about this hearing, I said something about being up there with the guys, and his response was to ask in feigned disappointment if that meant I wouldn't be wearing a dress. I could give you many other examples of his sense of humor, but I'm not here to talk about me or to embarrass him. Um, I would try to embarrass him, but his mom is here, so, <laughs> so I'll re refrain. My point is simply that among his many other great qualities, Josh is a warm and engaging person who tempers the importance of his work with his humility and sense of humor. He's much like our Chief Justice in that respect and will be a great addition to our state's highest court. Thank you. Uh, I want to make a comment. I, I did not raise the issue that I did because I had any question about Josh Groban's ability to be an outstanding judge. I expect him to be as good a judge as Carlos Moreno and Art Gilbert and you think he will, and the Jenny Commission thinks he will. I was raising a question not so much about Josh Groban as about Jerry Brown. Um, my question is, is it healthy <clears throat> uh, to have a court on which only a minority of the members of the court have sat on a trial or appellate court? Look, this is the biggest judicial system in the world. The California judiciary is twice the size of the federal judiciary. No nation has as many judges. We have more in LA than there are in Great Britain. Um, because we're so litigious. Now, you, 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 you don't have, you, you don't have uh, um, uh, what I think a court needs. Uh, look, yes, Roger Trainer and Hugo Black, you know, were great judges, but they didn't sit surrounded by people who had never been judges. Uh, and uh, the, the question, I think, that the appointment raises in the minds of many people is are the, the quotidian events <clears throat> that go on in the trial courts of this state and in the appellate courts of this state going to be fully appreciated by a large number of judges who've never been there? Well, let me just say, I, I think Josh will most likely do what a number of others of us who didn't serve on the trial bench before coming to an appellate court have done, which is to go to the Bernie Whitkin College and to um, mingle and really um, s you know, hear about and, and kind of feel what it's like and, and the difficulty of being a trial court judge. But I also think, as Art alluded to, um, he, J Josh knows many of us. He's not going to be sitting unsurrounded by people who've served on the trial court bench because we're all around him, not just on the Supreme Court, but on the, the first district. And for that matter, he's appointed half the judges in the state or thereabouts he's been involved in, and he knows many of them. So I think he's a, l a little bit different. And last but not least, I think, look, the governor probably, and I don't really know, uh, made appointments one at a time, and he saw some terrific people. And as he saw them, he made decisions. I don't think you think of you know, this is a, a point where, yes, Josh is the fourth non-judge, but there were three others, and they have been terrific, and I don't think this will be any different. And what he lacks in that experience, he will find a way to make it up, because that's the kind of guy Josh Groban is. Well, you are right about one thing. He is a little bit different. He didn't go to Yale Law School. <laughs> <laughs> I forgive him that. <laughs> Thank you, Justice Stewart. So far, <coughs> A-plus for everyone. <laughs> uh, now I invite Ronald Olson to the podium. Justice, Chief Justice Cynthia Ewick, uh, Justice Klein, General Becerra. Let me just say at the outset that it's a high privilege to be here to endorse Josh Groban. I uh, am a 50-year member of the State Bar of California. I have worked the courts in our state up and down from municipal to the Supreme Court. I have uh, served on a number of committees that have assessed judicial candidates, including chairing the ABA Federal Judiciary Committee that assessed numerous 
Court of Appeal judges and one Supreme Court justice. I believe I know a great judge to be when I see one, and I am convinced that Josh Groban will be a great judge. Josh worked at our law firm, Munger, Tolles, and Olson, for six years before he became the secretary, the legal secretary for Governor Brown. In those years, in trial and out, and in an appellate court environment and out, he built a reputation as a poised litigator. He served a roster of some of our most important corporate clients, including Wells Fargo, Boeing, Universal Music, many others. Each of these cases that I've taken note of, he was confronted with important and serious substantive and procedural issues. He found difficult uh, substantive issues and difficult procedural issues. He sought out not only in addition to these kinds of clients, a pro bono client from the first day we knew him and carried out pro bono work in that environment. In this work, he demonstrated what I found to be keen thinking, gifted writing, and a unusual, uncommon ability to draw out the best from witnesses in court and out of court. Justice Klein, if I may, in response to your inquiry, um, it seems to me there are a lot of ways to learn about the important values and practices of a trial court. Josh started, as several have noted, clerking for Judge Connor in the Federal District Court. I clerked for a judge. I think it's quite common for those judges to share a lot of what goes through their mind in resolving matters with their clerks. While I don't know Judge Connor personally, I would venture a guess that he did the same. Learning from the well here in front of a trial court is, in my opinion, at least as good a teaching laboratory as sitting on the municipal court or other trial courts. It is different, to be sure, but you recognize the values the procedural importance, and you recognize decision-making from this side as well as the other side of the bench. I want to say just a bit about his work habits. Josh was distinguished not only by his own long hours, but I think importantly by his ability to listen to and generously support the work of his teammates on their projects. He would, in my mind, do the same as a court sharing the important deliberations of our Supreme Court. I will conclude, subject to your questions, by saying that his integrity based on my six years of being close and thereafter less close, but still in con regular contact, his integrity is above reproach. And I have a few thoughts on his temperament. It has been said that he who travels the high road of humility need not worry about traffic jams. Josh has traveled that high road of humility since I first met him. He's coupled it with a very large dose of humanity. Humility, humanity, and his personal commitment 
and professional commitment to fairness has distinguished him throughout my time with him. I am confident that these qualities will further distinguish him, and I would predict will further distinguish our great California Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Next, we will hear from the Jenny Chair, Mr. David Firmino. I invite you to the podium, sir. Good morning, or it's good afternoon now. I've been here all day, members of the commission. The Jenny Commission conducted its evaluation of Mr. Groban on November 27th of this year, finding him exceptionally well qualified. It was the second opportunity we had to, to do that. According to commission rules, the rating reflects the commission's determination that Mr. Groban possesses qualities and attributes of remarkable or extraordinary superiority that enable him to perform the appellate function with distinction. Mr. Groban received his BA degree with honors and distinction in modern thought and literature from Stanford University in 1995. While at Stanford, his work was published in HarperCollins' annual compendium, quote, a reader for writers, close quote, and he was chosen to assist the staff of the Stanford Law Review in evaluating and editing articles for submission. He received his JD degree from Harvard Law School in 1998. He was a member of the Harvard Civil Rights Civil Liberties Law Review and was an award-winning teaching fellow for his class the history of the Warren Court. While at Harvard, Mr. Groban assisted Professor Charles Ogletree with preparation of death penalty appeals and cases arising out of the independent counsel statute. Following law school, he clerked for the Honorable William C. Connor, United States District Judge for the Southern District of New York, and then joined Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison in New York City as a litigation associate. While at Paul Weiss, he handled a wide range of commercial litigation, including but not limited to antitrust, internal and regulatory investigations, and was lead counsel for the firm's largest pro bono case at the time. The case, brought under the Americans with Disability Act, sought relief for over 5,000 people with mental illness who had been, quote, warehoused in substandard adult homes throughout the city. He was awarded the Scales of Justice Award from MFY Legal Services in New York for his work on this case. In 2005, he joined Munger, Tolls, and Olson in Los Angeles as a senior associate handling complex commercial litigation. At Munger, his high-profile matters included a billion-dollar contract dispute for a defense contractor that culminated in a lengthy trial. In 2010, Mr. Groban began his journey of public service, joining the then-fledgling campaign of our current governor as general counsel. In this capacity and with a skeletal staff, he served as a chief legal advisor on all policy issues, including criminal justice, immigration, corrections, and environmental issues. He also served as a principal advisor for all internal legal issues, including contract negotiations, campaign finance issues, and First Amendment libel and defamation issues. Since 2011, Mr. Groban has worked as senior advisor to Governor Brown. In this capacity, he advises the governor on high-profile litigation pending at the trial and appellate level and provides legal and policy advice to the governor on issues related to criminal justice, the courts, regulatory reform, consumer protection, constitutional law, and corrections. Mr. Groban also serves as the advisor for all judicial appointments in California and cites his work in connection with this responsibility as the professional accomplishment of which he is most proud. At the conclusion of the current administration, he will have assisted in the appointment of nearly 600 judges, about one-third of the state's judiciary, comprising the most diverse group of appointees in the history of the state, not only in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, and sexual orientation, but also in terms of practice background. He has received an appreciation award from the Multicultural Bar Alliance, the CJA Scales of Justice Award, the Legendary Champions of Justice Award from the California Black Lawyers Association in recognition for his contribution to the courts, and in particular, his work to promote judicial diversity. Mr. Groban has been an active community volunteer. From 2009 to 2011, he served on the board of Watts House Project, an organization that sought to develop community-based art installations in Watts. He presently served on the board of the Larchmont Chapter School, a school in Los Angeles devoted to serving a diverse, and underserved student population in Los Angeles. He has participated for the last two years in a program sponsored by the Los Angeles County Bar Association entitled Dialogues on Freedom, in which he and other participants speak in underprivileged high schools on various constitutional issues. 
He has spoken throughout the state on issues related to the, judi the judiciary and has provided guidance regarding the judicial, excuse me, judicial appointment process to the members of numerous bar associations and legal organizations, including California Women Lawyers, the John M. Langston Bar Association, the Mexican American Bar Association, the South Asian Bar Association of Southern California, and the Asian Pacific American Bar Association. Mr. Groban has not only served the governor in the role of a traditional judicial appointment secretary, but has routinely been called upon to construct in advance complex legal arguments, negotiate with the le legislative branch on a host of complex issues, including those involving juvenile justice and the death penalty. Raiders uniformly support his appointment to the court and describe him as having a sharp mind, keen powers of observation, effective listening skills, and an uncommon ability to communicate. He has remained academically engaged teaching state appellate practice at UCLA Law School since 2015 and supervising student externships at the Second District Court of Appeal. Mr. Groban has an outstanding scholastic background and significant legal experience in civil practice with major law firms on both coasts. As an executive branch attorney, he has hands-on experience in, in advising the governor on a broad range of substantive and high-profile matters involving education, criminal justice, and immigration. He has worked assiduously to help the governor carry out his pledge to further diversify on the bench a, contribu a contribution borne out not only by available data, but by the comments of laudatory raiders and his awards, therefore. His intellectual capacity and understanding of the law and appellate practice are extraordinary. He is both empathetic and kindly in demeanor, even tempered, and maintains a sense of humor. Judges throughout the state, from the trial courts to the highest appellate levels, praise his exemplary skills. His broad range of experience, his love of the law and learning the law, and his affirmative desire to hear diverse viewpoints suit him ideally for consideration of the wide array of cases that come before our Supreme Court. I would like to add a personal note as well and to say for the last uh, year, uh, I have observed all of these qualities of Mr. Groban. He is dedicated, he has a sharp sense of humor, and uh, if you think of who your favorite college professor was um, and, and, and the funniest person in your life rolled into also one of the keenest minds, that is Mr. Groban. He's incredibly dedicated to the judiciary in this state and has provided an, a, I think a gift to, to all of us as citizens and we're lucky to have had his work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Firmino. I now invite Mr. Groban to the podium to present a statement, if you wish, and to answer any questions the commission may have. Madam Chief Justice, Attorney General Becerra, Presiding Justice Klein, I'm truly humbled to be here today. I hope to have the opportunity later this morning to say a few more words, but I'm keenly conscious of our time constraints, so I'll try to now be brief. Principally, I want to use this time to acknowledge my wife, who's here today with a sleeping three-year-old on her lap. Uh, when the governor took office in 2011, we were not yet <laughs> married, and in the blink of an eye, we got engaged married, bought a house, and now have a six-year-old and a three-year-old. And as I suspect everyone in this room and on this dais knows well, many of us have pursued careers that have required incredible sacrifice from our partners. In the last eight years, while I was able to fully commit to the best job I've ever had, my wife, managed through many mornings alone with young kids while I had left in darkness before anyone else was awake, juggled constant days of travel where I was not around at all, celebrated several birthdays and a few anniversaries while I was out of town, repeatedly tolerated date nights and quiet nights at home that were interrupted by work crises and long phone calls, and calmly accepted at times some financial stress as we managed uh, raising two small children in Los Angeles on a government salary. Not only did she do that without complaint, but she supported me, encouraged me, helped raise two be beautiful children, and in her free time built a successful career as a writer. I suspect everyone in this room shares the same sense of gratitude for our partners, 
and a deep appreciation for the fact that we would not be here without them. And for that, I wanted to acknowledge my partner and all of the partners that make these kinds of careers possible. Second and lastly, I wanted to say that one of the great blessings of my job has been able to meet so many fine jurists around the state. Uh, and as a consequence, I have gotten to know in varying capacities each of the justices of the Supreme Court, or as my six-year-old calls it, the super court. And for three, for three of you, I was lucky enough to be involved in your vetting, talking to colleagues, interviews, reading everything you'd written, including for one of you a very long PhD dissertation, uh, and for another listening to old audio recordings of her arguments before the United States Supreme Court, and for the other three, again in varying capacities, I've been able to get to know each of you. Uh, this knowledge makes me aware of one indisputable fact, and that is if I am lucky enough to be confirmed, I will be able to work with true, with six truly amazing, brilliant, kind, charismatic, special people. And my six-year-old, as he usually does, has it just right. It is the super court and I am humbled and elated at the prospect if confirmed of joining you. With that, I defer to any questions the panel may have. Thank you, Mr. Grober. Any questions? Just talk. No. Actually, it's, it, it sounds like the job you're going to take is a lot easier than the one you have. <laughs> 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 I wish you and your family uh, much luck in the future. Uh, if you can figure out a way to keep litigants as content as I see your two kids, uh, <laughs> it's going to be a good mark. Uh, answer a question for me. A conventional justice, will that or will that not be what you are? You know, um, I, I, I hope... I hope to be many things. I hope to be conventional in the, the sense of following in the great tradition and incredible norms that have been created by what you've heard is really the most esteemed state Supreme Court in the country. I hope to be conventional in the sense of being duty bound by precedent uh, and the like. I only hope to be unconventional in the sense that I think each of the justices of a court in a collaborative process um, provide their own unique background and experience and point of view. And for some of them, it is incredibly valuable judicial experience. For others, it is experience at a solicitor general's office or in academia. For me, I hope it is experience in private practice and as an advisor to a governor. And in that way, I hope each of us um, would add our own uh, perspectives in doing what is our ultimate charge, which is trying to make the best decision in each of the cases that are before us. You were more respectful than I thought. In <laughs> let, me, let me probe a little deeper then. Um, because as uh, Justice Klein, I think, raised some critical issues about the composition of the court or the courts, um, I think for many of us, California represents a place that's been very unconventional mm -hmm. when, it, when it's come to giving people an opportunity to demonstrate what we stand for. Um, and my sense is that your fingerprints are on a lot of California today, and it being, while a very important player in the American body, um, I think some people look at California as being outside the box. And to me, it's, it's not a matter of widgets or quotas. It's about recognizing the value that we 
bring to the table. Um, and so the discussion about whether you served or didn't serve on a port before or whether you came from northern or southern California, it's, it's, it's all part of who you are. And uh, California seems to extract the best qualities in most. But can you divorce the law from the political realities that you will face as one of the justices on the Supreme Court when you're about to rule for not just 40 million Californians, but quite honestly, as we've been talking, uh, Americans throughout this country? We are, if confirmed, we are always guided by the law and the court um, really has the luxury, quite frankly, in this rancorous political climate of um, being duty bound to distance itself from uh, political considerations. That, is, that said, I, I think, as has been said here already, each justice brings with him or her a sense of who they are and their values, a sense of empathy, a sense of a nation created for all, a sense of fairness, uh, a sense of kindness and compassion. And I hope, if confirmed, that those values will carry with me and guide me. Thank you. I will say, uh, Mr. Groban, that I often say about the Supreme Court, I think we are the best alchemy of boots on the ground, scholarship, and national experience. And I think because of our alchemy together, uh, maybe I'm biased, but I think we have some of the most tremendous discussions amongst very thoughtful collegial people to advance the rule of law. Um, my question to you is, I know and have been informed uh, by, by folks on high that you have been so much more in the governor's administration uh, than uh, the important role of judicial appointments advisor. I know that you have been involved in so much policy that affects California, that sets the example nationwide or even internationally. I know you've been a presence in many of those meetings, and I know that you have this realm of experience that you will bring to us that's different in terms of executive policy, particularly as shaped in the last eight years of California, that is setting an example for the rest of the country. So my question to you is, coming from the executive branch, is very different from the judicial branch. Uh, the judicial branch is a third branch, a check and a balance on the other two branches as they are on us. And it has been alluded here, my question is, um, how will you, with uh, so much experience in policy and um, creating the rule of law, how will you approach conflicts in the rule of law as a judicial officer? I should preface it by, say, by, by noting that, uh, as others have said, this is a, appellate courts by their nature are a composite group, and each of us um, will bring to bear his or her experience. We've talked about um, some of Governor Brown's more recent appointees, but of course, this is a larger group. The Chief Justice, Justice Chin and Justice Corrigan, uh, by my count, I believe, have a combined 89 years of judicial experience amongst them. It is a staggeringly impressive number and, and, and an experience that, if confirmed, I am sure I will be enriched by every day. Uh, other members uh, come to us as uh, previously esteemed academics, one served two presidents, one uh, was a superstar in the Solicitor General's office, and I have, as you've heard described, my own background as a private practitioner and in the executive. Conflicts in the law um, at core require us to be, to look to the law, to the legislative history, to the intent, but at a certain point, as this court uh, knows well, when there truly is a conflict, will require us uh, to inquire 
about what are the practical consequences, what was the intent, and even at times, if there is a true conflict, what is the just result, what is the fair result, um, and those are all considerations that I think uh, have, have, have to factor in when there's any conflict. Thank you. This does complete the list of witnesses who have been called here to testify. Are the members of the commission ready to cast a vote? Yes. Yes. All in favor of confirming Joshua Groban for this position, please say aye. 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 On this record and the correspondence received, the commission finds Mr. Groban qualified to be an associate justice of the California Supreme Court. Congratulations, Justice Groban. Justice Groban will be taking the oath of office later, but I do invite you, Justice Groban, to the microphone here at the head of the courtroom for a few remarks, as you wish. I just want to say a few thank yous. I want to first thank the governor for having the confidence in me to select me for this position. I will try every day to fulfill the promise he saw in me. I want to thank my family, my mom and dad, for making me believe since I was a little boy that I could do anything, even be a Supreme Court justice, and who taught me that empathy for others matters more than anything else. I want to thank my wife for her support and my children for bringing me joy every day of my life. I want to thank my in-laws for traveling from New York, my cousin Amy for flying in, and my friends who are here, many of whom also traveled to be here today. I owe a deep debt of gratitude to Justice Moreno, Ron Olson, Justice Gilbert, and Justice Stewart for their support and for their very kind words. I am honored to have you in my corner. I want to thank all of the judges and justices who are here today to support me particularly the APJs, many of whom traveled to be here, and I'm most flattered. I want to acknowledge the Jenny Commission and David Firmino. The last eight years have given me a front row seat to their important and diligent work, and our state judiciary is much better for it. I want to thank each of the commission members, the Chief Justice, the Attorney General, and Presiding Justice Klein. I have such immense respect for each of you that it is an honor to have been confirmed by you. I want to thank the chief and her staff for the amazing kindness and support they've shown me, particularly Jorge Navarrete, Charlie Cahoon, Amoy Kim, and Greg Curtis. I also want to thank each of the justices of the court who have already been so kind and supportive. I want to express my deep appreciation for my Deputy in the Judicial Appointments Unit, Debbie Kuhn, who is here, who is amazingly upbeat, loyal, diligent, and unflappable. Finally, I want to acknowledge Justice Catherine Werdiger. The occasion of my selection uh, to a position that she had retired from has caused everyone who's congratulated me to also remind me of something I knew well that Justice Werdiger is a brilliant legal mind, a beautiful writer, a consensus builder, and the kindest person you'd ever want to meet. She is an inspiration to me and many others. Thank you to her, and thank you to each of you, and to 